I just want to wish all of you a very happy 2016. I hope all your wildest dreams and greatest aspirations come true. Good news is that the year of the cockroach 2015 is finished. So let's look on the brighter future right now. Um, I realized after I'd put out an invitation for this particular epic that perhaps uh, I should have suggested a different alternative. For some people, uh, a question might be a little bit too specific and too limiting. So maybe there are some people who would have preferred just an opinion to have another subject uh, discussed. There's a difference between the two. Um, however, let's move on and deal with those people who've been kind enough to submit questions. Trouble with the question is, uh, you really need an awful lot of data before you can give a good answer. So, uh, think very carefully when you ask a question, whether you've given sufficient information to the person that they can answer the question that you've got. Uh, let me just see what uh, we've got up. First of all, we've got a question by uh, Razia Razi, who was kind enough to submit a, a question. Uh, I hope I've got your name right. Um, she says, thank you for doing this session. My question is, what are the precautions or special preparations, especially for young lungs and diaphragm, for a beginner who wants to start training exhale dives? The goal is non-competitive and just for leisure diving to be able to stay longer under and uh, not be burdened with waiting issues. I tried exhale static uh, and felt tremendous tightness on the chest that I couldn't finish it. Thank you for your answer. Okay, um, first of all, let's examine how we use exhale diving. We use exhale diving to shallow depths. Uh, it could be 10 meters, uh, 20 meters is for a very advanced diver. And it's to prepare people for deep diving only. It has no place as far as I'm concerned in the swimming pool. There are a few people who do FRC uh, performances in the swimming pool. I'm full of admiration for them and I'm also extremely interested in it. But um, at least one, I believe he was an Australian, I think his name was something like Barnes in England, did 154 meters. But why I'm mentioning this is I saw, I think it was on Instagram, a picture of Razia with a monofin where I think she'd just done 100 meters uh, dynamic. Uh, that's hardly a beginner. I really doubt if your main direction is swimming pool diving, whether exhale diving is going to be any use to you whatsoever. We use it very specifically to train a number of things for deep diving. The first of all is an equalization technique and uh, particularly beyond what are called equalization failure points. An equalization failure point is where your equalization gives out. In other words, where you've got to RV, residual volume, and that'll depend on what your, the de that depth will depend on uh, whether your residual volume is 25% or 20%. Uh, but beyond your um, RV, uh, how we equalize. So it's training that, it's training inurement to pressure because we are simulating great pressure in very shallow waters by doing total exhale dives. So we're building up the body's acclimatization to uh, pressure. The other thing we're doing is psychologically getting used to the sensations uh, that we would be feeling at depth. In fact, it simulates both physiologically and psychologically nearly the whole story. The thing, the element, of course, that is different is uh, time. 
An exhale dive might take a minute, a minute ten for quite a deep one. Um, and that might be the equivalent in physiological terms, in mathematical terms, in everything else of a dive to a hundred meters. Uh, however, the big difference is, of course, time. One's going to take you a minute 20, the other one's going to take you, I don't know, three minutes 40 plus, depending what discipline you're doing. So, really, first of all, uh, the lady ain't a beginner if she's doing 100 meters dynamic. But, on the other hand, she hasn't said exactly why she wants to do these exercises. If she's preparing herself for depth, uh, I would suggest that uh, it would have been a good idea to tell me what depth she's doing at the moment because if it's beginner's depth, as she defines it, uh, it's unnecessary and even dangerous to do exhale dives, full exhale dives, unless your system is prepared physiologically for that. Uh, the best preparation for that is dry, doing a lot of what is called in yogic terms Udayana Bandha. It's total exhale and then lifting the diaphragm up into the thoracic cavity uh, as far as possible. Uh, the trouble is that if you look up Udayana Banda on uh, YouTube, you find people doing not only Udayana Banda but Nauli, which is a very complicated and very spectacular exercise with, where the uh, side muscles, yeah, the transversus, etc., cave in and the abdominal ridge sticks out and then they rotate it and do all, all kinds of weird stuff with it. Uh, that is a yogic exercise, it's a kriya, it's for churning, it's for a particular purpose, all to do with cleansing and diet, and it has really no pr practical application for freediving. Just lifting the diaphragm part of it certainly does. Um, the, here we get into uh, another suggestion you will find on the internet, unfortunately most of it's in Spanish, uh, some very good exercises which are called hipotension. Uh, they recommend uh, Udayana in all kinds of different positions. Some of it is uh, connected to the idea of fascia linkage, uh, which is also a very, uh, a very good idea for free diving. It's a good idea at all for health and free diving. Um, and somebody warned about these exercises being dangerous. In thousands of hours of this stuff that I've watched, been party to, uh, everything else, I have never heard of anything going sour on that. If you follow the recommendations, don't do these exercises yeah, after eating, four hours after eating, on an empty stomach and uh, the chin lock when you're bent over is a very good idea because it stops uh, blood being pushed up into the head. Other than that, a few safety precautions which are taught with the exercise. This can be something that I would even recommend to beginners if they're thinking about uh, depth training at some time. In other words, it's getting the body ready before you can do the actual empty lung training. I hope that gives you as uh, full an answer as I possibly can. Thank you for asking your question, Radzi, and all my good luck. The second part of your question uh, is by implication. I don't... You say that you want to do it to uh, increase your breath hold capability. It will not increase your breath hold capability on full lungs. For that you need full lung breath hold training. And uh, there's no point in looking at it as just uh, diminishing the amount of weights that you can use. Um, that's certainly not applicable to depth diving, unless you're just planning to do uh, long breath holds in fairly shallow waters. Uh, that's the best I can do for your question. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, the next question is by Mr. Salim Yosef. Uh, thank you for your question here. It's concerning early contractions. Uh, this is a very, very it, common question in the sense that I'm asked it an awful lot. Uh, the answers that I give may not be the whole story. And uh, we have formed a certain opinion about this, why contractions happen early. Uh, as I say, there seems to be no particular scientific um, research into this, why it happens earlier in some people than others. I can only tell you my opinion from training experience, which is, I will admit, a few years. Um, Basically, uh, to illustrate this, just recently this year I had a lady here um, who was a national record holder uh, in the swimming pool in dynamic and dynamic no fins. She was doing 205 meters dynamic and 160 meters uh, no fins. And one of the questions that I asked almost straight away was, when do you get your first contractions? And uh, I wasn't particularly amazed to hear at 40 meters. Well, that's an awfully long time suffering contractions. It can't be a pleasant experience. Uh, she was bearing, if you like it, all the mental scars of this, of... Uh, associating deep dives with um, extreme discomfort. And if you have enough of that, you kind of lose your appetite for practice, particularly practice at a high level. My opinion, which will not be a popular one, is that it basically it's due to what I call head banging. Uh, people who want to progress too quickly and are pushing the envelope too hard, too fast. Now here's the thing, very often in free diving, and this is something that can be learned both by depth divers and the rest, you can do it, but there's a price and you will pay the price. So I tend to think that this is the price for this. Something else, Yosef, in your um, question, made me associate this with the kind of tension that is by somebody who is trying to progress too quickly. You said that you had something like a lung squeeze from a big contraction to a dive to 17 meters. Uh, first of all, there's no reason why you should be getting uh, contractions uh, at 17 meters. I mean 17 meters should take you about 17 seconds. If you have a three and a half minute static breath hold, this is not in any way uh, can be associated with a sensation of running out of air. It's all lack of acclimatization to pressure, and that means that you're, you're trying to progress too quickly. Uh, you've got to ask yourself, why the contractions? The contractions are, quite simply, a reaction to pressure, in this case, not to the length of time that you're holding your breath, and it's because your body is unaccustomed to pressure and associates the feeling of being compressed with a feeling of running out of air. It's confusion, physical uh, confusion by the body. The result is tension, and the moment you have tension, you can get lung squeeze, you can get all sorts of penalties that you don't want. So, my advice to you is take a big step back and develop a motto for 2016 and this I was something that I would recommend to all divers and particularly to advanced competitive divers patience take time what is the rush 
you don't have to do a hundred meters in depth this year. You don't have to do a world record in static or dynamic this year. Take your time. One of the best divers that I've ever met is Guillaume Neri. Guillaume's secret was that he had patience. He spent years and years and years developing into a phenomenal diver, probably the best I've ever met. Um, I hope that answers your question. It's a very general answer. It means that if you're going to go on pushing as hard as you can, the contractions are going to come earlier and earlier. One of the best re uh, recipes for early contractions is to do extreme CO2 exercises. There are all sorts of very extreme CO2 exercises that are being recommended by experts in the pool. And in every case, what they are doing is that they're just making you con get contractions earlier and earlier. Is that a good idea? I don't think so. Early contractions mean a lot of discomfort. A lot of discomfort means you, that you lose the, the will to train. And apart from that, you haven't got your warning system. I mean, come on guys, if I, can, if I take the normal thing that people are born with and say 50%, I should be getting contractions uh, at the earliest at 50% of my maximum. I have some kind of idea how much longer I can go on. If I'm a 205 meter diver and I'm getting, I'm getting contractions at 40 meters, I've no idea where, where I'm going. Uh, so take a step back and I reiterate again, patience, go with it, it will produce the results. There'll be very solid results and you'll enjoy your diving very much more. Thank you for your question. Okay, the next question actually is from James Klusky. James, uh, in answer to your question, yes, I am back in Elat now. I'm sorry my uh, visit to the UK was absolutely full uh, of non freediving activity um, and I'm very sorry that we never got a chance to meet and I'm sorry that uh, I had such a limited time there. Uh, I had a very tight schedule. I'm coming back to England on the 19th for three days but again that'll be filled with uh, stuff that I have to get through and um, I hope later on in the year I'm going to have more time there and I hope we'll get a chance to meet. Anyway, very happy new year and lovely to hear from you. I'm back in Elad, it's completely safe, it's dry, it's not underwater like the rest of England and uh, the weather's fine. Uh, people are not walking around in terror here as they appear to be in London, Brussels and what have you. Um, so what can I tell you? Uh, it would be lovely to see you here as well. Uh, Gary Hunter. Um, I wouldn't have expected a simple question from Gary. Uh, and he hasn't disappointed me. He says, uh, hi Aaron, as you said, winter is here. Um, so can you please give details of empty lung exercises we can do in a four meter deep pool to prepare our lungs for depth? Many thanks. This is um, a very, very important part of training. Let me go into prerequisites for this before we go any further you need to develop uh, flexibility in the whole of your thoracic cage, that's the intercostal muscles, uh, all the rest of the so-called uh, thoracic muscles, thoracic cage muscles and the diaphragm. The best exercise is uh, the exercise that I talked about in the last question, Udayana Bandha. Um, it can be found on the internet, uh, on YouTube, difficulty there is an awful, as I said before, an awful lot of people combine it with a yogic kriya, ex cleansing exercise called nauli, which involves creating an abdominal ridge and rotating it. It looks very spectacular. 
Uh, it's not all that difficult to you to do, but it has no application for free diving. The one of just lifting the diaphragm certainly does. Uh, hipotension, particularly for people who speak Spanish, because there are several uh, you, uh, very good YouTube videos about this. All of them, as far as I'm concerned, are in Spanish. I haven't seen a good one in English. Um, but you can definitely get the idea of what the, what the exercises are. It's not complicated. Um, that, as preparation, as a sort of prerequisite for pool training, uh, I think is very necessary. Now, to go into pool training, let's first describe the objectives of this. The objectives are first of all to learn a technique for good equalization at depth, how to retain air at depth, how to recover air at depth, and when to, and how to get the body used to a feeling of pressure. So all the pool exercises, empty lung pool exercises, are empty lung to RV. They are not FRC. I have no use whatsoever for FRC diving. You can't quantify it. In my opinion, it's a lot more dangerous than empty lung because you can go a lot deeper with it. Uh, one time you exhale a bit more air, the next time a bit less. Uh, I'm exaggerating, but even small differences can create uh, huge differences in performance and everything else. You may think you're progressing. Uh, you're not. You're not just letting out enough air. Uh, you may think, hey, I'm not progressing. Actually, you are because you're letting out more air. Uh, so let's say that all our exercises in the pool, in the four meter pool, have to be to residual volume. It means literally. <laughs> And with the last bit of air that we can squeeze out, we fill our cheeks and go down. Now, we have to rig beforehand, this requires preparation. We have to rig uh, something that we can go down on. This can be a buoy, a rope and a weight. Um, or uh, there was a pool that we used in La Paz that had some very handy installation a pipe that went along the bottom, uh, went down the side of the pool and then along part of the bottom and we could go down the vertical part of the pipe which was very handy. I have also used in my history um, pool cleaning pipes. Uh, let me be clear about what that is. There's either a sort of mini vacuum hoover that is used um, to clean the bottom of a pool where dust collects. Uh, those poles are usually sort of two inch uh, aluminium poor poles and they can be, uh, they're obviously much longer than the four meters depth of the pool, probably about six meters. You can hold that with sufficient force upright that somebody can invert and go head down the pool. That's the next thing, that you remain in a head down position. When you get to the bottom, you do not go horizontal. You keep in a vertical position, head down. Otherwise, all the measurements that I'm going to give you are virtually useless. So the first things that you do are simply going down on residual volume with full cheeks and equalizing. Now we use a very different variation of equalization. There are the, we didn't, don't make any claim to inventing it. There's a lot of people who've taught themselves. I think it's, things that, it's something that occurs to quite a lot of people spontaneously. But it's one that we recommend and that we use. 
and that is we do not use a frenzel with a full mouth. In other words, we do not use our tongues to equalize. What we do is very slightly move the jaw forward, drop the jaw so we've got maximum space in the mouth with the lips together, without opening the lips, creating the maximum space because when your cheeks have collapsed, you've still got sufficient space for quite a few more equalizations if you're not clenching your teeth where you've diminished the inside volume of the mouth. Now, in order to keep the soft palate open, all it's necessary to do is very slightly move the jaw forward, not in an exaggerated fashion, but very slightly forward and that will keep your soft palate open. It'll stop it closing. There is no reason why your epiglottis should or your glottis should open uh, because you're not using your tongue at all. What we are using is the cheeks like we were trying to squeeze air or squeeze water out of the cheeks. We squeeze them like we were trying to propel water out of them but are not allowing the air to come out. Now, this does not mean that we keep up a constant pressure the whole time. We do keep constant pressure in the cheeks but each equalization is a separate little pulse. You shouldn't see a lot of movement with the mouth while you're doing this. You certainly shouldn't see movement with the jaw or a particular amount of movement underneath. This is a uh, equalization technique that is very soft, instantaneous, very quick and extremely effective. Uh, you need to be uh, pretty clued into it, pretty experienced with it to be able to teach it to somebody else and correct it. Because you're looking for very, very small signs and it means very good communication between you to find out whether the thing is working and if it's not working, why it isn't working. However, moving on from that, once we've had an explanation of the equalization technique, what we're doing is that we are breathing in an upright position in the water, filling our che cheeks after total exhale with the last bit of air, filling our cheeks, inverting, going down to the bottom. Now, we remain on the bottom in the head down position and feet up. We do not go flat. We see if we can equalize on the bottom. Only when we can equalize on the bottom do we go to the next stage. The next stage is we go down to the bottom and this needn't be in the same, um, in the same training session. It may be in the next one when we can equalize on the bottom and we're actually equalizing in the head down position on the bottom we go down to the bottom again head down we exhale more air because you'll find that with the help of the extra pressure that you got down there that you can squeeze more air out then we refill maybe not enough to make our cheeks really puff out but we refill enough that we can equalize again then we expel that air and do it again, up to three times. Now, not necessarily again in the same session. I'm trying to make a, a kind of short explanation here and I hope I'm not cutting too many corners. The idea being the first one, it's a success if we go down there, exhale the air and manage to refill enough by bringing the diaphragm up a little bit, very gently, yeah, and maybe even making the noise like a whale noise in the back of the throat to bring a little air up to equalize again. When we can do that, we try doing it twice. When we can do that comfortably, we go on and do it three times, which should be is about the maximum that anybody can squeeze out. 
Now the next exercise is actually sound a lot uh, less advanced, but actually they're a hell of a lot more advanced. What we do is that we stop on the way down at one and a half meters at definite points on the way down, practically meter by meter. Yeah, exhale a little bit more. Yeah, get rid of our mouth fill, refill on the way down, and equalize again and again. The idea being here that we're simulating much more what is happening actually in the water. Yeah, that as we go down in the water, we're losing our cheek fill. Remember to keep your jaw open, but your lips closed. And uh, we see how far we can get with that one. Okay, Gary, sorry. Uh, Concerning uh, the third part of the exercise, uh, I would prefer that if this was in a private conversation, uh, this is not a single question. It's quite a long story. It's going to involve a lot of question and answer of when we refill, how we refill, all the rest of it. The basic thing that we're trying to do, the basic idea, is to keep up the pressure in the cheeks as much as possible on the way down. You have to keep up that. So, at first, it may not be involving uh, expelling air, it may be in just keeping the pressure going, just doing little refills as the cheeks begin to collapse. After each equalization, a small refill. The thing that causes more problems with lung squeeze is people waiting until they've lost all the air, air in their mouth before they refill. And then they do a massive movement and that causes the lung squeeze. So what we're trying to do is get people into the habit of doing small refills all the way down. Uh, this third stage is really a very complicated process. I would prefer, Gary, that it was in a, a private conversation between the two of us. Um, and then we can do much more of a question and answer thing. In the meantime, I wish you a wonderful 2016 and thank you very much for your question. Bye. Uh, Lowry, uh, the next question is from Lowry Alto. Uh, it's been a long time since I heard from you. It's wonderful to hear from you. Um, uh, really want to know how you're doing. Uh, Lowry asks about dry exercises, whether they are valuable, whether they're worth it in free diving, etc. Well, the first uh, part of the answer to that is I would need more information. Luckily, if I remember rightly, I remember that you're from Finland. So that gives me a clue that maybe certain types of exercises that I would recommend in other circumstances might not be applicable to your particular environment. This is the problem. Uh, that it depends what a person has at their disposal when you're recommending dry exercises. There are some simple ones. Dry exercises for lungs I uh, heartily recommend when it comes to Udayana Bandha, Hipotension, back bends, uh, ball exercises that are specific to the thoracic cage front and back, all these things I recommend highly and I think that they're extremely valuable, I think they're extremely necessary. One I do not recommend and actually forbid my students to do is stretching on a packed lung. I consider it dangerous and I consider it totally, absolutely unnecessary. It's a stupid affectation. Um, and I can't see any use for it whatsoever. As a determining factor in how deep you're going, uh, your residual volume is a much more determinant factor than the amount of air that you can pack in your lungs. If your residual volume is 20% as opposed to 25%, that means your failure of equalization point is going to be a lot deeper. Um, therefore, in theory, you can go a lot deeper. Packing doesn't work that way. 
uh, there are pluses and minuses to packing. Some of them are debatable. Uh, some of them which I think have a strong possibility, one that it delays the onset of uh, blood shift, which may be detrimental. Two, that it can cause a greater degree of narcosis, a depth, simply because of the amount of uh, nitrogen that you are packing in as 78.4% as of the air that you're packing is going to be nitrogen. And uh, the other reason is the question on completely different type of things, but probably not applicable to it. the very vast majority of people, is the question of decompression sickness. That it could move you closer to the point of that. Uh, that's something from my very distant past when I was doing a lot of um, no limits at one particular time, and it would have been more applicable to that. However, um, apart from the debatable, and those are uh, questions of um, the uh, negative points of, of packing, uh, one that is, I think, indisputable is the fact that it is taking you um, costing you a lot more effort in the first stage of the dive. And uh, delaying, obviously, the point at which you will go into the glide. I think that this is, there can't be any dispute about that one. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, the glide is an enormous conservation of energy, of, um, of oxygen, of all the good things, and the earlier we can go into it without decelerating, uh, the better. So uh, let's leave out stretching on a packed lung. I think it's dangerous, I don't think it achieves much, and Packing in my book is questionable anyway. If you need to pack, depending on which question, depending on which uh, position you ventilate in in the water, if you're ventilating in a vertical position, there is some case for packing up to the point that you achieve the same volume of air in the lung that you would at uh, achieve if you were lying on your back on the surface without the pressure on your diaphragm, or if you were out of the water up to that uh, same level. There is a case for that, but I think it's basically a question of weaning people off um, what has become a sort of psychological prop more than anything else going. I, I see it as a technique that may be disappearing. Um, so, all the stretching exercises, I think, are vital. Not only lung stretching, but I think flexibility in all its forms. And I think we have to be very analytical over this, particularly for monofinners, etc. There's an awful lot of people that have uh, very good flexibility in the lower part of their back and absolutely none in the upper part of the back. This is particularly true of male divers. So it means specifically looking at what needs uh, assistance when you're doing dry training and really going for that and training it very intensively. When it comes to strength training etc uh, there's definitely a case for it. I'm not a person who likes weights. Uh, there are innumerable full body exercises where you're training a lot of muscle groups at the same time. It's not only a more economical way of training, it's a much more balanced way of training and in my opinion much more efficient and gives you the kind of strength that you will need as a freediver. The old favorites like push-ups, pull-ups, uh, Chinese push-ups, which are means that you go into a handstand against the wall, uh, bend your elbows until your head touches the ground, and then push up back into a handstand again. All the kind of body weight exercises. Uh, the TRX is a fantastic machine, and uh, its various imitations I heartily recommend. 
Now, Lowry, we're back to the question of Finland, aren't we? Um, I did say that there are specific things in uh, various countries that I could give a person in a different country that would be applicable and not in their particular country. Finland, from what I understand, is pretty flat. One of the best and most efficient exercises for gaining the kind of fitness we need for freediving, including uh, tremendous uh, lactic training, etc., are hill repeats, where you find a very steep hill, you sprint up it as fast as you can for 20 seconds, walk back down to the bottom, and immediately you've hit the bottom, sprint up it again. You do that four times, you'll find that your knees are spaghetti. People have got to the point of vomiting on the amount of CO2 that they've absorbed on that. It is very intense training. You don't do it more than twice a week. However, it is very, very effective for getting you fit. It does require that you have some sort of anaerobic, ba uh, sorry, aerobic base before you go into that type of training. But I don't think it'll be a great help to you in Finland because I don't think you've frankly got the hills that uh, are easily accessible to what we had, for instance, in Mexico. So uh, I'm going to leave that particular one. There are substitutes for that, but there are, uh, I mean, I think it's less intense. I think it's less effective, but uh, interval training on the track uh, sprints, short rest, sprint, all these kind of things. I think that they are good, not as good, but I think they're good. And I think that they're definitely beneficial. Uh, I think I've covered the, the gym training, which should be stretching and body weight exercises no more, with a huge emphasis, uh, emphasis on the stretching. Um, as for breath hold training, again, I ran into a problem because I have a long-time student in Sweden and I was giving him um, uh, our version of the breath walk, which I think you know as well, uh, which does involve also uh, taking your pulse and working with the pulse, um, noting it, watching changes, uh, changing the, the program because of the readings that you're getting back from the heart monitor. Now, in Sweden, uh, when I recommended this, it was autumn. He went into winter and they have apparently uh, half an hour of daylight a day practically in Sweden. I don't know what it is, some ridiculously small amount of daylight and they have a horrible thing there called ice. It's not something that we know in Elat except in your drinks. Um, anyway, he had a nasty fall. So in the end, I've become more and more sensitive to what I'm recommending to who and where they are. So it's really a question of knowing what you have at your disposal. Some people have gyms uh, my son in England has a gym uh, close to him that has uh, very tall ropes for rope climbing. Uh, a terrific exercise for training people who are going to be doing free immersion, uh, particularly on breath hold, and doing it also maybe even on uh, RV. I hate to mention that. Uh, it does have safety precautions involved with that, which we I'm not going to describe at the moment. <coughs> but uh, they're all valuable stuff. It's again, I'm merely bringing that one up, not as an exercise that I particularly recommend, because it would need a much fuller description and a much fuller description of the safety involved. Uh, what I'm trying to say is it very much depends what you've got at your disposal. Uh, I have uh, a long-time um, student uh, who has become a friend, who has recently done uh, all the Romanian, or a lot of the Romanian records in depth. Um, two of the three, I think. Um, 
and he is actually captain of a giant tanker um, and he trains exclusively dry and his progress has been uh, practically totally linear and absolutely brilliant so the short answer to your uh, question Laurie is yes I do heartily recommend uh, dry training it's far better than sitting back drinking beer and uh, eating uh, rich Christmas food and uh, I really uh, wish you good luck with that but you do have to know uh, what a person's got at their disposal in the lines of conditions etc before one gets into that very deeply Thank you for your question and really all the best of luck for 2016. The next question uh, comes from Arsenio. Happy New Year in Arsenio. Uh, he says, I recently took an ADA level 2 course and although I had a decent performance, I suffered a hard time equalizing my ears. I went to the ENT and found I have a deviated septum in my nose. Could you give me some tips to overcome my problem? I find it very hard to equalize descending head first. Thank you and Merry Christmas. Now here's the thing. Um, the worst person usually to ask about uh, equalization of the ears is an ENT. Uh, usually what they will do is that they will stick a light uh, little machine in your ear and they'll ask you to equalize and if they see the eardrum move uh, there's nothing wrong with you and then they'll look for problems look most people have a deviated septum it's a question of how much very 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 few people have it to a degree that would actually impede equalization I know of one uh, guy in England who had the greatest problems with uh, equalization. He went to an ENT who told him exactly the same story. Ah, oh, mate, it's because you've got a deviated septum. Great. What do I do about a deviated septum? There's nothing you can do except surgery. Okay, I'll go for the surgery. He had surgery. He came out of it. He healed. And the position was exactly the same. He couldn't equalize. Then uh, he came across a bit of luck and he found out how to equalize the technique and he said oh my god that's so easy and that's what everybody says when they pass through the other side of the looking glass. Now what tells me that it's got nothing to do with your deviated septum is the way you phrase this question. I have a problem head down. That applies to me that when I'm head up, I don't have a problem. If you are equalizing head up, this is for everybody. If you are equalizing easily, head up, going down the rope, yeah, but you can't equalize head down, you are doing Valsalva. Think about this for a second. Valsalva means that you are pushing air towards your ears using your diaphragm. Now, that works beautifully if you're head up because air tends to rise up towards the surface and it tends to rise up in your chest towards your ears. You're only being helped by the pressure gradients. Now, Think of what happens when you're head down. Your diaphragm's down here, your ears are up there, and they're pushing against the pressure, which, may, which gets greater and greater the further down you get, and you very soon reach the point in which the diaphragm cannot push the air efficiently towards the ears. In most people, this happens about 8 to 10 meters and they can't get beyond that. Oh yes, but I can do 22 meters head up. Hallelujah, you're doing Valsalva. You want to learn yeah, how to go deeper, then you have to learn a different system of, of equalization. 
We call this the Frenzel, invented by a Dr. Frenzel, who was a doctor from the Luft, uh, Luftwaffe during the Second World War, who taught his Stuka pilots who went down in steep dives a very quick form of equalization. Now, that involves, I have a whole video which you can find on YouTube if you dial simply Aaron Solomon's Frenzel and it explains in extreme detail how you do this and how it works. Basically you're using your tongue yeah, to push air up towards your, your eustachian tubes and towards your middle ear. Now that is using the amount of air that you've got in your mouth. So in other words, that's how much pressure difference there is, which is nearly none, between the back of the mouth and the ears. So instead of moving it 60 centimeters, it's moving it maybe one and a half centimeters. So uh, the friends will work much, much deeper uh, in a head down position than Valsalva works. So I suggest that your problem is not a medical problem, not a physiological problem, but a question of technique of equalization. If you persist, if you look at the video and not just go through the uh, exercises automatically, but you actually think about them and think about what's happening here, what's happening and what's not happening each time, if you do that enough, you will get it. There have been so many people who've written in and say, wow, I've got it now. Yeah, I didn't know I ever could. I thought it was impossible. I've got it now. Read the comments and you'll find exactly yeah, that you've got a good explanation there of how to do it. And I wish you luck with it. And it's uh, certainly something that's achievable and it's not something that you have to go under the knife for or anything like that. Uh, so I wish you a very happy and successful 2016. I Freedive XB. Aaron, can you please explain how you would feel when MDR kicks in and how to train it? Wow, okay. Um, not quite sure what you mean here. I think you're, you, there's a little bit of confusion here. I'm going to try and sort that out, but I may have misunderstood you. So, uh, it's a very short sentence. Uh, let me try and deal with it. MDR, mammalian dive reflex. The mammalian dive reflex kicks in the moment we leave the surface. The uh, thing that I think you're talking about is not the mammalian dive reflex. We can train the mammalian dive reflex. Uh, one of the things that does help to train it is, of course, empty lung exercises, uh, all this kind of thing. Um, and there are things that actually work against uh, the training. So we have to understand that. But I think what you're talking about is after we've reached uh, equalization failure point. Uh, the failure point means when you reach residual volume. When you reach residual volume, there's no more air to bring up from your lungs to equalize your ears. Uh, with most people, yeah, this happens, they have a residual volume of between 25 to 20%, 20 usually dependent on the level of training. The less percentage we have of residual volume, the deeper we can go without incurring any particular equalization problems. Now, here's the point. Um, I think what you're talking about is how we equalize beyond this point of equalization failure when we can't bring up any more air. Uh, the basic answer to that is, uh, the most popular answer to that is of course cheek fill or mouth fill. Uh, there's a difference. Uh, 
The standard mouthfeel technique is that you feel your cheeks and you do a frenzel. Okay. Um, and of course, uh, that works. And it works for a lot of people very deep. Uh, I have found that for quite a lot of people, it is, it, there are better ways of doing it. Uh, simply because with the frenzel, uh, you can get leakage of air back into the lungs because you are moving your tongue and a lot of the, when you're moving your tongue, uh, what happens is that uh, you can open your glottis and air can go back into your lungs. Uh, so you have too much air leakage. We have a different technique which involves just squeezing the cheeks. Uh, I don't want to go into that in detail at the moment, it's a whole different question on its own. So basically you have the mouthfeel technique beyond that and you have the most important part of it when do I refill and this is one of the least uh, understood parts at what point yeah do I take the mouthfeel at what point is that mouthfeel going to give out and when do I refill okay I'm a firm believer in taking the mouthfeel early, somewhere between 18 and 22 to 24 meters, not 30 meters. The idea of the deeper I can take the mouthfeel, the deeper I can go, doesn't work. It works on paper, it doesn't work in fact. Um, and it's unnecessary. There are people who are going very, very deep who are taking the mouthfeel 18 meters. Now, when is that mouthfeel going to give out? It might give out as early as 55 meters. Now, are you going to let it give out? In other words, are you going to wait until mm, I have no air in my mouth and then try and refill? If you do, then you're inviting lung squeeze. I teach a different way of doing it. We take the mouthfeel on the surface, just as we're leaving the surface, boom. And then it's little top-ups to keep up the pressure in the cheeks the whole way. So you never reach the point where the cheeks are really, I don't have anything. The other big tip in this one is that the mouth, if we allow it to do so, can contain quite a lot of, uh, quite a big volume of air, even after the cheeks have collapsed. Now, obviously, if we have our teeth together, the volume of air left inside the mouth is small. Now, imagine that we have the lips closed, but the jaw dropped. Even after our cheeks have, uh, have collapsed, we have, a, and can't collapse any further because of the, our teeth, we have a very considerable volume of air in our mouths that is capable of doing quite a few equalizations deeper. So it's a question of um, really learning the techniques well. And for this, again, patience, guys. Don't run towards it. So many people run towards depth because they think they can get there. And they get there, okay, but then they pay the price. Either with lung squeeze or with anything, it's not taking the time to completely master a technique. Patience. This ought to be the motto right across the board for all freedivers for 2016. Patience. The most successful freediver probably of our time, uh, Guillaume. Yeah, has taken years and years and years to get where he is. And he has got to a place that very few people have ever touched before in their lives. Um, and that's no disrespect to the other freedivers 
who I'm, who I am well aware of out there, and even some who are not competing today, like Martin Stepanik, who was one of the greatest divers I've met. Um, and uh, I don't think I need to run through all the list of names of the of the greats of today, but I'm just saying that Guillaume is a superb example of somebody who has taken the time, been patient, developed slowly, methodically, realizably, and systematically. And it has paid off enormously. Um, there you go. So take the time to learn all the techniques uh, involved in mouth fill, filling up correctly, at what depth you take the mouth fill, uh, and to do continuous top ups, not continuous pressure. That's a different thing. Continuous little top ups, perhaps even after every equalization. And uh, so that we're never having to do one giant movement that uh, will either succeed or not succeed, but very often ends in uh, lung squeeze. So I wish you good luck with that. Uh, and uh, I hope I've answered the right question there. It's not 100% clear to me. Thank you, iFreeDiveXB. Uh, I hope you have a very good 2016 and all success in the world for that. Okay, the last question that we're going to be dealing with <laughs> um, is just fun. Uh, Ioannis writes in and uh, uh, it's hard to know. It's always hard to know when Ioannis is being sarcastic. I strongly suspect something here. He says, Aaron, I want to know how you are so awesome. Uh, if he was serious, which I very much doubt, and I think that we know each other well enough to presume that he wasn't, um, I would say it's only because we've never met in person. Um, the people who know me best, Alice, my son, Alina and the cat, um, don't hold that same opinion. Uh, there is a thing that uh, no man is a prophet in his own village. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, it was very sweet. Um, and you're awesome too. So have a wonderful 2016.